Good evening, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers, Dr. Kumar Prabhash sir and uh, Dr. Anuradha madam for giving us this opportunity here. And uh, without much delay, um, we all know uh, MET is a kinase and it's a proto-oncogene. And uh, when it gets mutated in cancer, it becomes an oncogene. And what type of alterations are known in cancer for MET? MET uh, primarily uh, has three different types of genomic alterations, exon 14 skipping mutations, amplifications, and fusions. In all the three types of DNA level alterations, MET overexpression has been a common phenomena. Uh, however, um, MET overexpression by IHC unfortunately does not seem to be a very strong biomarker. Even NCCN guidelines have said that we are not in a position to consider IHC as a robust mark methodology to look for MET gene expression. So what we know about skipping mutations, skipping mutations in MET exon 14 uh, constitutes about 5% and these are oncogenic driver mutations. And then amplifications, de novo is about 1% to 5%. And um, when it comes in the context of EGFR TKI resistance, um, these uh, MET uh, amplifications constitute somewhere between 5 to 22%. And um, in most of the EGFI TKI resistant, MET overexpression is seen, but not always a MET overexpression leads is underlying by an amplification. The take home message is that even though a strong MET IHC is observed, that does not necessarily indicate that there is a copy number amplification in MET gene. So this is a very important take home message for all of us. So basically, what is uh, MET? MET is the kinase, as I said. If you look at it carefully, this exon 14, when it gets, uh, you know, deleted, essentially skipping leads to deletion, it leads to constitutive activation of the uh, kinase. And that is how it becomes oncogenic. And um, so moving on, since uh, today's topic for me was primarily to discuss on exon 14 skipping mutations and MET amplifications, how do we do it and what technology is approved and what are the other technologies available and how we can kind of use as a alternative when one technology is not available. So before moving into exon 14 skipping, I wanted to quickly finish on amplification because it is pretty straightforward. And uh, as we all know, it is a mechanism of resistance. As I said, fish remains the gold standard like HER2 amplification, where uh, people have uh, looked at it in detail and they have um, said that a copy number less than 2.2 uh, is considered to be low, greater than 1.8. Intermediate is 2.2 to 5, and greater than 5 is uh, considered amplified. However, from the recent literature, what we understand based on clinical outcome and prognostication of these non small cell lung cancer patients, a MET amplification, if you could read here below, um, yes, I can see this now. A high level MET amplification, this is the jargon or the techn uh, technical word that's being used. High level MET amplification essentially means a copy number greater than 10 as given by NCCN is where you would significantly see some kind of a response to a MET TKI. Otherwise, this MET amplification is essentially not translating to uh, oncogenic driver as a significant driver there. So this is one of the important take home messages. And we know Tepotinib uh, is uh, being well um, studied in the context of MET amplification and non small cell lung cancer. So moving to exon 14 skipping. So as I mentioned earlier, what is it essentially happening is when the MET gene loses this particular green color region, it becomes short. When it becomes short, it does not get degraded. So every cell, the protein gets degraded, right? The life of this MET 
protein increases and not only that it also takes another advantage of survival by becoming oncogenic so this is the one of the fundamental molecular events that happens in non small cell lung cancer patients in a small subset of 1 to 5% wherein you see this kind of an oncogenic transformation from a normal protein or a normal gene and this is what leads to the activation proliferation and subsequently malignancy so therefore uh, now we understand the biology how can we address the targets so the kinase domain since this phosphorylation remains constitutively on it can be targeted with drugs and that is where it becomes a potential therapeutic therapy drug and who is often known to be associated uh, patients over age of 70 with smoking history and uh, uh, some histological correlation in terms of pleomorphic carcinoma or adenosquamous are often candidates who could carry metaxon 14 skipping mutations so this is the story or the evolution of metaxon 14 skipping or for that matter any met alterations uh, it all started with the discovery in 1994 and then uh, uh, slowly there were different uh, preclinical clinical studies where people started using uh, met specific inhibitors and geometry phase 2 trial was one of the landmark trials where capmatinib was used followed by that we have vision phase 2 trial and then uh, we recently got approval for capmatinib and tepotinib in metaxon 14 skipping uh, uh, you know it's already part of the nccm guidelines so how much it is metaxon metaxon 14 skipping we all know uh egfr alterations there are 19 different deletions in exon 19 put together there are about 23 alterations which was known as a textbook information for egfr for a very long time subsequently different case studies came up and then now we have something like 42 alterations in egfr which are known to be oncogenic now what is known in met to call it a hot spot region and or rather what are the mutations in met which are documented in literature to show that this particular mutation definitely leads to a oncogenic phenotype since this is one of the landmark studies where uh, they looked at um, 298 cases uh, uh, for non small cell lung cancer where they identified 165 different variants in met exon 14 in and around it was a hybrid capture based approach i would come back to that on technology later basically this is one of the uh, you know largest studies which shows the spectrum of mutations so looking at 165 this study is also not um, recent it's probably about 2018 or so so as in when we come across new patients i'm sure we're going to see more and more exon 14 new varieties so the take home message is this is exon uh, 14 this is exon 13 mutations that happen in this entire region and little on the other side are responsible to create a kinase where exon 14 gets completely deleted therefore uh, a hot spot panel or a targeted panel which only looks at these specific set of mutations will never completely cover the scope of testing so therefore one needs to completely sequence exon 13 intron 13 exon 14 and intron 14 in order to confidently say that i have not missed out any exon 14 mutation skipping mutation in this particular patient this take home message is very very important because when you look at hotspot targeted panels you have a, a very high tendency not covering a few regions in the intron particularly because of poor coverage and several other factors and you miss the variant and um, 
moving on even with rna the story is again different so my the topic of discussion was ihc versus ngs um uh, sorry ihc was not part of it either you look at fish i uh, and uh, ngs and pcr i brought in ihc because it's a protein expression for met do we have any role for ihc because ubiquitously as i said in my first slide 50% of non small cell lung cancers do have met expression but that met expression does not have an underlying biology very well documented so this is one study where people tried to prove can i see a met exon 14 skipping mutation or a met amplification correlating to ihc the correlation was very very poor so beyond that it was considered that ihc cannot be a robust marker and nccn guidelines are clearly indicated no ihc as a uh, testing methodology um what is the most effective approach qpcr based approach it is a very simple and easy to understand approach basically what one can do is if at all your mutation uh, is to understand whether exon 14 is lost or not take the mrna put your probes on 13 and 15 and see whether 14 is getting sequenced or not this is a simple pcr approach however uh, in this process the challenge here is with ffp the rna is highly degraded there are many times you have an assay failure or uh, part like uh, necrotic material comes in fixation artifacts would be there all these contribute to the quality of the qpcr assay and you have very high chances of missing that's why the sensitivity is not so great but it is very decent greater than 90% to pick up exon 14 mutations by rna so there are disadvantage like any other technology but we have to live with that till we find a good technology now moving on to ngs um in ngs there is so much which has been discussed in this uh, two day session there are several speakers who spoke about exon protein skipping i wouldn't go into many details as i told you earlier amplicon means you target a specific mutation on either side locally and try to amplify that dna and look for the mutation when you do this you are predetermining your mutations you are only focusing on those 165 which were referred in that article to screen for it maybe the patient has a mutation which is beyond 165 if it could go up to 145 165 it could be beyond that also so nature can make mutations that can lead to oncogenic activation beyond what is being doc because as we are treating we are constantly learning the landscape and therefore amplicon based approach although it becomes cost effective because you are only looking at small regions it is not going to completely cover the scope of testing there is your disadvantage however when you take hybrid capture capture based approach you are not only sequencing the exons but also the introns that is again a design perspective um some labs might just do a little bit on the intron by hybrid capture and still say we are using hybrid capture so essentially as a clinician what uh, uh, or as a laboratory scientist who takes the onus to say that i have completely screened for exon 14 skipping mutation we have to ensure that intron 13 and intron 14 are completely covered with the splice junctions on exon 13 and 15 to confirm that we are not missing any exon 14 skipping mutations i think in the I, i am running out of time right uh am i running out of time suruchi yes i am i'm quickly finished pretty much uh, the same thing what i discussed earlier this is dna versus rna based approach again here hybrid capture most important uh, take home message here is the tumor content should be greater than 20% in order to look at it at the dna level but dna has a advantage because between dna and rna in ffp dna stands out to be slightly better in quality as compared to rna because it's not as labile as rna therefore your diagnostic yield is going to be slightly better off 
So this is one such assay which we developed in house. I'm just showing the screenshot of only the Meg's Met Exon 14 skipping. We all talk about 100x, 200x depth of coverage in NGS, right? And not only that, the coverage. So if you see the label here, this is Exon 13, Exon 14, Exon 15. The way the sequencing is done or the way the probes have been designed is such that the entire region is adequately sequenced multiple times from different cells. This is what is evident here that if you get a coverage like this, this is what we call it as coverage. If we get a coverage like this with very good depth, horizontal as well as vertical, this gives us the confidence that we are not missing anything in terms of screening for mutations. And we are confidently saying whatever we are saying, whether it is positive or negative, we do get a good confidence because seeing is believing. So um, there are multiple assays and uh, foundation one works on DNA based, Oncomine works on RNA based approach and snapshot assay is a hotspot panel. And I just described about our essay. Uh, just a last note here. Although we know that RNA-based approach is good with NGS panels, there is a recent evidence from India, from Dr. Maushmi and uh, Dr. Anurag Mehta's group. They have raised a red flag that they could see a few false positive uh, reports in Exxon 14 skipping using Oncomine assay. Although uh, recommendations are RNA-based approach, I think there is a chance of false positivity, non-specific binding with RNA because RNA gets heavily degraded. When the size of DNA becomes smaller and smaller, the, there are very high chances that non-specific primers will bind and amplify the DNA and you tend to get a non-specific non signal. So size of template is very, very important in NGS, minimum 150 to 100 basis. That is what FFP DNA gives us and even cell-free DNA gives us. So this is the uh, you know study where they looked at um, capmatinib in both 14 skipping and amplified, and they have shown that there is a good anti-tumor activity. The take-home message is when selecting the most appropriate assay for broad money, we have to consider the assay limitations. Uh, very, very important. And at the same time, uh, we need to also look into what is available with us in terms of patient material and then take your call. What is best which we can do for the patient? So one needs to take a uh, careful call for each case based on different factors, tissue availability, FFP, RNA quality, tumor cell percentage and technology. Uh, and it might, your choice of technology might change from patient to patient. For some patient, maybe you got a fresh tumor av available. You might want to look at it in an RNA based approach. For some others, maybe you don't have anything left. You may want to look into it and self free DNA based approach. So, guidelines and recommendations are there, but tailor made treatment will be the, uh, you know, heart of treatment landscape, you know, treatment modality in oncology. And uh, so, uh, that's where I would like to stop and uh, thank you so much once again and would like to take any questions. There are no questions.